modern eyes, 1917 was the year of the Russian Revolution and the entry of America into the First World War. A defining moment in the history of mankind. But this is viewing the past through the prism of history. For people living in Bristol, these events had no bearing on their lives. Russia and America were far away and it was completely irrelevant. But one thing was certain. Significant numbers of local men were going to the front line and the women at home were taking up positions reserved for menfolk. It was taken as read that their wives or sweethearts would do the right thing and wait for the boys to come home. But an event at Platform 5 at Bristol Temple Mead Station at 12.50pm on the 15th of October 1917 would show the illusion of this trust. Over to you, James, to tell the tragic events of this story and the aftermath. Most of our episodes tell of the location of the murder and its relevance to the story. But this is not the case, as Mr and Mrs Cross normally lived in Henry Row in Baptist Mills, on the edge of Bristol. But we need to examine their recent past to make any sense of the story, which is set in 1917. Private Albert Cross was serving with the Gloucestershire Regiment in France and by all accounts was involved in actual fighting rather than being labelled a base waller. He was unaware of his wife's pregnancy until he received a letter from a James King of Barton Hill on the 27th of August. It told him of the condition of his wife and that he did not want to have anything to do with her. Obviously, Cross was not the biological father. This gave a whole new meaning to a Dear John letter. The husband was understandably upset by this revelation, especially as they had two children. He applied for compassionate leave, but this was refused, and he had to wait until the 6th of October before he could get back to Bristol. Understandably, there were a number of letters between the parties relating to this matter. The cuckold cross wrote back to James King and stated that the latter should stand by the woman he had ruined. Given that King had nine children, this would appear unlikely. In it, he accused King of being a coward. Powerful words in 1917, when a man of a certain age could be given a white feather by a woman, if not in military uniform. He emphasised that he was finished with his wife, but would protect her and suit the welfare of his two boys. Cross now turned his attention to his estranged wife. He enclosed a letter from her lover and his missive drew out his inner vitriol. It did not involve any sentimental acronyms. It would be interesting to know the attitude of the censors on seeing it. He accused her of being a lying, vindictive woman and would take the children away from her. Bessie Cross replied in a conciliatory manner. She accepted that she was in the wrong and stated that she would have to go to the workhouse as King had abandoned her and her husband was about to abandon her as well. This was no idle threat. Prior to the welfare state, society relied on the Elizabethan poor laws to help those unfortunates who fell from favour. It is no exaggeration that women of easy virtue who became pregnant from other men whilst their husbands were fighting for the British Empire would invoke little sympathy. The key part of her letter was the two boys, which emphasised that a move away from their mother would break their hearts. Albert Cross rode back in a calmer mood. He stated that he had made plans to have the children taken away but still claimed that he loved her, despite admitting to the accusations of infidelity. In it, he talked about the number of times that he had mentioned to her the behaviour of men who preyed on lonely women and then abandoned them. On the 6th of October 1917, Cross arrived back in Bristol on leave and would stay there until the 15th of October for the return to the front. He contacted Walter Hart, an inspector of the National Society for the Protection of Children. More puzzlingly, he arranged a meeting with James King and his wife at his house. 
Later, King would say they left on good terms. There is no mention of further marital discord, and Bessie joined the throng of people wishing the men well on their way to an early death, courtesy to the blunders of high command. Fast forward to Platform 5 in Bristol's Templemead Station, as a crowded train of military personnel kissed and waved to wives and sweethearts before embarking to the war. There certainly was no talk of, it will all be over by Christmas. Suddenly, from nowhere, a shot rang out and the crowd initially froze before they rushed to Bessie, who had fallen to the ground but was still alive. She was bleeding profusely from the wound. Among them was a military policeman called Frederick Whitlock who arrested Albert and escorted him to the porter's room prior to the arrival of the police. Albert was reported to have said that the soldier he had arrested confessed, I have shot my wife. She is in a certain condition by another man. There was no safety catch on the rifle, so it's possible it could have been fired accidentally. The culprit was in serious trouble. Ada Webb of the woman's police patrol had heard Bessie cry, Don't do it! Don't do it! before the fatal shot. She was rushed to Bristol General Hospital, where she died a few hours later. Open and shut case, one would think. But as Bismarck once remarked, laws are like sausages. It's better not to see them made. And this story was certainly mangled. Normally, we do not mention the coroner's court so often, as it merely echoes the later Crown Court sessions. But we're going to, as the exception proves the rule. Two days after the shootings, PC Tyler found a packet of letters relating to the whole affair, which were read out in court. James King was asked to comment on these and admitted he was the author of one and stated that he'd been seeing Bessie for eight months and was aware of her pregnancy. He had also written to Albert Cross regarding Bessie's other infidelities. His easy-going charm did not impress the court and the jury made the unusual decision of stating that he was the real culprit and the author of all Bessie's woes. They were duty-bound to state that Albert Cross was the murderer, but he had acted on extreme provocation. The scene was now set for the main hearing. The prosecution told the jury, even if Cross did not commit murder, there was enough evidence for him to be convicted of culpable negligence, meaning manslaughter. The defence piled on the sympathy, as they emphasised Cross's character, and he was doing his duty in France whilst James King was busy seducing his wife. King was even described as a dastardly coward, which in the context of 1917 was a serious slur. To emphasise Cross's decent character, it was pointed out that he had forgiven both Bessie and King. There was, however, the little matter of the actual killing and his words after the event. This was explained away that Albert was in shock as he did not realise that there was no safety catch. A poor excuse from a trained soldier. In a scene that could have come out of a courtroom drama movie, the judge summed up the case by helping the defence. He emphasised the letters and that the jury should distinguish between a civilian and a frontline soldier. In the end, the jury declared that Albert was not guilty. Now, John, this is an intricate case in a difficult time of history. What do you make of it all in the context of the First World War? So why did Albert Cross not go to the gallows or the government not called for an appeal on the grounds that the judge clearly misrepresented the case. There was no reason to believe that a soldier on leave was not subject to the same rules as other non-military personnel. He was under no danger and was waving his wife goodbye. Yet he shot her, and there was a credible witness as to his wife's reaction prior to her death. We have to look more closely at the situation in 1917. 
we know of the change in the status of Russia and America, but other events that have been forgotten by modern audiences which plagued society at the time. Both Germany and the British Empire were feeling the strain of the war, irrespective of the other two powers. The Western Front had turned into a stalemate and there had been mutinies in France because of continued losses at Verdun. Both Germany and Britain were beginning to make serious mistakes that seemed to produce short-term advantages but had serious consequences. Germany agreed to unrestricted submarine warfare that provided President Wilson with an excuse to call for the US Congress to declare war on Germany. Matters were not helped by the discovery of the Zimmerman telegram that urged Mexico to declare war on the US. The British were likewise making their own long-term mistakes. The Balfour Declaration between Alfred Balfour and the leader of the Zionist movement, Chaim Weissman, at the Midland Hotel in Manchester, began the process of the creation of Israel and the current crisis in the Middle East. Britain was consumed with anti-German feeling that resulted in the king actually changing the name of his family to that of Windsor. There was talk of a coitery of German spies, and like all good conspiracy theories, there was a touch of sexual deviation. France likewise was also gripped by hysteria, and this resulted in the part Asian dancer Matahari being shot for treason. But let us return to Bessie Cross. Her mother, Mrs. Hedder, had been cross-examined at the coroner's court and admitted that she had led an immoral life but had not introduced James King to Bessie. She claimed that on finding out James King was a married man, she advised her daughter to decease from seeing him, but Bessie refused. Obviously, it was the married man part of the story that prompted her advice, rather than the realisation that cheating behind your husband's back was unacceptable while he was fighting for king and country. But take a look at the jury. As women did not get the vote until after the Great War, it would have consisted of men. But most men had been enlisted or about to be conscripted. Therefore, we can safely assume that it consisted of elderly men, very sick, that family members and friends were about to sacrifice their life, while certain types were shirking their responsibilities and preying on women. To make matters worse, they were not doing the decent thing and marrying she who is no better than she ought to be. To them the war had changed everything, and not for the better. This story is not well known, but it must be contrasted with the case of Ruth Ellis, who shot her lover, Derek Bentley, outside the Magdala pub in the 1950s. Both would certainly be classified as crimes of passion. We have to accept the rather extraordinary behaviour of society in 1917. We had gone from a Christmas truce of 1914 with men playing football to kicking dachshunds in the street. But this hides the real underlying message. Cross was an example of the British soldier just doing his duty and caring for his two boys. Ruth Ellis was a nightclub hostess and would be certainly be classified as no better than she ought to be. Did their fate rest not on the facts of the case but society's perception of them? But why did James King write to Albert Cross. He had to write the letter to Albert Cross, otherwise he would have to provide for the child. War is a bit like the genie in the bottle. Once opened, you never know the result. <laughs>